as we try to predict what we're going to face these next four years. Good morning, I'm Jonathan K. Part, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Welcome to Washington Post Live and another in our series, Race in America, History Matters. February is Black History Month, so we're continuing our examination of the role Black women have played throughout American history. My first guest today is historic in her own right, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, Democrat from Ohio and chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus. Chairwoman Beatty, Welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you so much for having me and what a wonderful time in history to be here with you. And a reminder to our audience, we want you to join in on the conversation. So please tweet your questions and comments to the handle Post Live. So Chairwoman, who are some of the women who have inspired you? Well, it's interesting when you read History Matters, it, it does. Uh, I start with the strong black women in my family from my grandmother, my aunt and my mother. And it's interesting, I saw Nanny Helen Burroughs name come across the screen. She was a best friend to my grandmother. I grew up in the church. Mm. And so I guess I would include her in the beginning, but certainly there are people like Rosa Parks. I grew up hearing about Rosa Parks and her giving up, her not giving up her seat on the bus in 1955. And then of course, Harriet Tubman and you have Shirley Chisholm. And then the young folks of today, I look up to Yolanda King, you know, a teenager, the only granddaughter of Martin Luther King Jr., who I've had the opportunity to spend time with. But Rosa Parks started it all for me. She taught mm -hmm. me to stand up for what you believe in no matter what, even if it's getting arrested. Uh, Rosa Parks and Fannie Lou Hamer kind of grounded me to stand up, to, to speak out. And then a local woman by the name of Edna Char Charity, early, good friends with Barbara Jordan. First person to tell me a black woman could serve on a board as a volunteer, but a paid volunteer. Uh, mm -hmm. So she exposed me to a lot of things. So I'm grounded with women like them, historic women. Mm -hmm. And so you talked a lot about Rosa Parks, which explains why you introduced legislation to establish Rosa Parks Day as a federal holiday. What's the significance? of such a national holiday? I think it's, it's very important for me because she opened our eyes as the mother of modern civil rights movement. You know, it was Rosa Parks that gave us so many of our legal gi giants in the movement, Martin Luther King Jr. because of what she did. Can you imagine for one year refusing to get on a bus, even if that was your only way to earn an income by getting or going to, to work. But the people stuck, they stuck together and fought for what they believed in, and it made a difference. And that's why in Ohio, I was the first to introduce the Rosa Parks so Day legislation. We have lost the connection. We have lost the connection with Chairwoman Beatty. Can you hear me now? Am I still not here? Or maybe we've all lost the connection.
Um, not sure what ha not sure what happened, but I'll take I'll take all the blame for the drop for the drop signal. You were answering a question about the significance of having Rosa Parks Day be a national holiday. Well, I think it's very important because in Ohio many years ago, uh, following Rosa Parks' life, I introduced legislation that became the first in the United States as a bill to designate. Rosa Parks Day. Coming to Congress and continuing to work on that and be an advocate, she did so much for this country. The mother of the civil rights movement, she helped us elevate Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, it was much more than just that December 1st day in 1955. It was her work that she went on to do with voter voting rights, voter education, getting people registered to vote. All right, because of our, uh, our technical difficulties, um, our time is limited, so I can't have you here and not talk about the big, big news, and that is President Biden's impending decision, impending selection of a black woman to the Supreme Court for the, the first time. Whoever that person is, what talk about the significance of having her on the high court, on society, and young black girls in particular. I think this is a historic moment that will change the way we look at the justice system, but it's so much more than the justice system. Think about the culture shift. Think about what will happen when we look at all of the issues that we're fighting for, civil rights, voting rights, criminal rights. It will make a difference because she will bring herself, her culture, her justice, her freedom, uh, a different voice that will be a voice that is void right now for us having it. It'll make a difference to not just black girls, but it'll make a difference to girls and women of all races, of all ethnicity. Um, there's a lot of concern, as you well know, that the president's pick will be the target of unprecedented racism and misogyny and sexism. Do you share that concern? Oh, absolutely. We saw it with First Lady Michelle Obama, who was just stellar in every avenue. We saw it with Vice President Kamala Harris, another giant and person of stellar intellect and experience. But we're ready. The nation is ready. We will stand up with whomever the president appoints. You know, Senator John Kennedy, a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, so he'll have a vote. Uh, whether the nominee at the nomination advances out of committee recently said, and I quote, I want a nominee who knows a law book from a J. Crew catalog. Talk about how offensive that is. Systemic, systemic racism, ignorance, uh, it makes no sense. When you look at the candidates that are being vetted, I mean, let's talk about their academic. Let's talk about their judicial opinions. Let's talk about what they will bring to the bench. Um, Congresswoman Cori Bush recently said, and I quote, we shouldn't be pitting black women against each other for this Supreme Court seat. I know in my gut what that means. What does that admonition mean to you? Oh, I share uh, that statement and I've even said it. Look, when you look at the women who are out there, for my opinion, they're overqualified. They bring everything that you would want in a Supreme Court justice. And so we shouldn't be picking winners and losers because they're all winners. The fact that your name is mentioned makes you a winner because the president will only bring the best and all of them are the best. Uh, no argument here from me. Uh, the Washington Post recently reported that some some activists privately worry that President Biden and the Democratic Party are not moving fast enough to name the potential nominee and pushing her through. What is your view of this? Oh, I, I don't necessarily support that. He said during his campaign what he would do. Many of us civil rights leaders, me as the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and other members issued statements that we did not want it delayed. We wanted him to keep his promise. And within less than 48 hours, he spoke to the nation and said that he would be appointing a black female to the Supreme Court. You know, you recently uh, asked Congressman Harold Rogers, Republican of Kentucky, to put on a mask before boarding the, the Capitol subway system. And you said Congressman Rogers 
then poked you in the back and told you to get on the train. What did you take away from that incident uh, and the congressman's subsequent apology? Well, I took away that we still have incivilities that people feel that they are privileged and that they can do and say anything they want to. But I think I sent a strong message to him. I'm about leadership and dignity and civility, but he clearly picked the wrong woman on that day. And I think he understands that. I refuse to accept his personal apology. He did a public insult, high profile, so he needed a high profile apology. So the Congressional Black Caucus went to the steps in support. I was never so proud of our Congressional Black Caucus and our leadership. Speaker Pelosi demanded a public apology. He gave it, and I hope he's learned a lesson, but certainly America knows that we are not taking the incivility, the systemic racism, and that he could disrespect me. Yeah, it, it, it went beyond just your run-of-the-mill incivility, what he said to you, and I'm not going to repeat it here. You've been in Congress, correct me if I'm wrong, since 1999. So you've been in the body, uh, in the House, for a long time. This incivility um, that you're talking about and that you have experienced, has it gotten worse? over time since I, you've been serving I think it's in Congress. Worse, but now I haven't been in Congress since 1999. I just want to, okay. I was in the, the state house during that time. State house, okay. I came to Congress in 2013. But so, uh, okay, let still, me that's a long say, time. It, it is a long time. <laughs> and let me just say, yes, it has gotten worse. Uh, there would be a time that we would disagree, but we would disagree, uh, we wouldn't be disagreeable. Uh, now there is a lack of decorum and respect for the House. And I think much of that is from the last administration. Uh, the president who bullied people, a president who was disrespectful, a president at times that was ignorant. And I think those who are following him, in my opinion, fall into the same footsteps. Ignorant, not having respect uh, for uh, the decorum of the United States Congress. And I think America really knows it when you see what's happening, the disrespect. Mm -hmm. um, that's a lack of leadership, a lack of understanding how you represent the people you serve. America is bigger than that, better than that, and deserves better than that. We have a couple minutes left, but I got to get you on one more thing before before I let you go. As you know, the House of Representatives passed the Freedom to Vote Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, went to the Senate, and it's not going anywhere over there. Now the conversation is all about reforming the Electoral Count Act. What do you make of the efforts to reform the Electoral Count Act? I think it's in the right direction. I simply don't think that it's enough. It is a great start. It's progress, but we're not giving up on the Voting Rights or the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. They're still our top priorities. And I equate it to when John Lewis and Martin Luther King set out to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. They had all the intentions of crossing the bridge, but they turned around, but they didn't give up. They came back and they made progress, and we will do the same. Chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, thank you very, very much for coming to Washington Post Live. Again, my apologies for the technical difficulties. That's all right. Thank you, and I'll come back again. All right, great. Coming up, Janine S. Nelson, Associate Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Hello everyone, I'm Ruth Umo, editor at Fortune, and I'm thrilled to be in conversation with two accomplished leaders in the just gender justice movement who are helping survivors find healing and justice. Joining me today is Danny Ayers, CEO of Me Too International, and Fatima Goss Graves, president and CEO of the National Women's Law Center. Welcome both of you. Thank you. 
Your two organizations, along with Time's Up, launched this incredible initiative called We As Ourselves, which in many ways is a call to action to center the voices and experiences of Black survivors and to really create the cultural conditions for Black survivors to be heard and supported. Danny, let's kick things off with you. What are those cultural conditions and what's missing or even incorrect in the conversation about Black survivors? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, the the legacy of enslavement, the commodification of Black bodies, a cultural myths about Black people's sexuality, the idea that Black people don't feel pain in the ways that white folks do, the adultification of Black girls, all of these things are conditions um, which leave Black folks unprotected and vulnerable. And it fuels the silencing of Black stories. Um, Black women are often disbelieved, disregarded, um, and sometimes re-traumatized and harmed in telling our stories. So this project is about centering Black survivors, creating spaces where they can share their stories and experiences, and we can shift the behaviors and cultural narratives that harm and silence Black survivors and build new practices where Black survivors are believed and supported. Yeah. Perfect segue into my next question. Fatima, the name for this initiative stems from a Paul Giddens piece, and it was meant to highlight the fullness of a Black woman's identity beyond how others would like to categorize her. Uh, as you know very well, Black women and survivors are a force in this country uh, in ways we see and in many ways that we don't. Talk to me about how Black women are shaping our future. You know, this project is unapologetically for Black survivors, by Black survivors, and, and we've been clear about that from the beginning. Oftentimes, Black women's experiences are thought of as adjacent to other systems. Um, you know, there's a big focus on Black women as voters every four years who show up reliably there's a focus on, on Black women as mothers and as caretakers, especially in this time. But the opportunity to focus on Black survivors, but Black women in particular, for their needs, for their entrance, not through the gaze of systems that don't always show up for them, that don't always love and support them. Um, that is exciting for us, and and we think overdue. It's it's almost our our love letter to them. Yeah. Well, let's take a couple of steps back because what's interesting about this initiative and so much of your collective work is that you explicitly discuss the need to find joy and to not let people take that from you. And that's particularly true for survivors. What brings each of you joy right now? And Danny, perhaps you can kick this one off. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. We're really excited at Me Too because this February during Black History Month, we are really celebrating Black joy and see joy as resistance, um, see joy as part of the work to interrupt sexual violence. And so I'm really excited and having so much joy around um, one, the completion of our survivor leadership training, which um, brought together survivors who do not have historically leadership roles in their community to really bring healing into those communities. And then the launch of our survivor sanctuary, which will be um, available to the public in Sexual Assault Awareness Month in April. Um, and it's a self-guided healing journey for survivors in five, 10, and 25-minute exercises that center mind, body, and integrative, and will be free and available for everyone starting in April. Fantastic. And Fatima? You know, every day for the last couple of weeks, I have woken up with such great joy because I get to be a part of the work to confirm the first Black woman on the Supreme Court. And it has brought me great joy over these last couple of weeks as the country has been introduced to the many Black women who could be in that seat, who could frankly fill up multiples of Supreme Courts. There's, there's such a, a deep bench. And 
I think we get to dream about what that world will be to have a Black woman contributing her perspective on our laws, given how much our laws impact Black women in this country. So it's not just that it feels long overdue. It really is a joyful celebration of Black women's leadership and experience and imprint on this nation. Very well said and such an inspirational way to end. Fatima and Danny, thank you both for your time. And now back to the Washington Post. Welcome back. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Welcome to Washington Post Live and another installment in our series on race in America, History Matters, co-produced with the Capehart podcast. We continue our examination of the role of Black women throughout American history with Janae S. Nelson, Associate Director Counsel and incoming president of the NAACP Legal and Educational uh, legal Defense and Educational <laughs> educational Fund next month. Ms. Nelson, welcome to Capehart on Washington Post Live. Thank you, Jonathan. It's wonderful to see you. So, as we know, February is Black History Month. Black women are the foundation of that history, American history. Who are the women who inspired you? There are so many women that have inspired me throughout my life and throughout my career. First and foremost, my mother. She is uh, the rock <laughs> upon which I stand and uh, I love her dearly and she has been an inspiration throughout my life. But there are so many professional women, so many women lawyers that I admire and look up to. Um, I'd say that among the many are, of course, Constance Baker Motley, who is in the uh, iconography of what it means to be an incredibly zealous and brilliant advocate, fearless, relentless, and committed to the cause of equal justice and civil rights. She also is one of the first female lawyers at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. She was one of the architects of Brown versus Board of Education, which as you know, dismantled American apartheid. And she was a mother. She was a community member. She was um, a, a, a second, a first generation, second generation immigrant. I mean, she checked so many different boxes in terms of what it means to be an American and what it means to be a leader in this country. And she is one of the women that I admire greatly, but I could probably go on and on about <laughs> you know, millions of others that I do as well. Well, let's keep talking about her because Tomiko Brown Nagan, author of the new book, Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality, recently told Washington Post Live, quote, historical significance and leadership are essentially coded male. Talk about the impact that's had on recognition of the contributions of black women in our history. I think one of the one of the um, easiest ways to point to the limitations that have been placed on black women is the fact that we still have not yet had a, a black woman as a Supreme Court justice. And you have extraordinarily qualified people like Constance Baker Motley, who was a federal district court judge, in fact, the very first black woman to become a federal district court judge, but was not elevated as she should have been uh, based on her record, based on her experience based on uh, her enormous potential to be one of the most excellent jurists that this country has ever known. And that glass ceiling 
that is, uh, you know, doubly thick for black women is something that uh, I'm acutely aware of in the profession still. And it's a loss for this country not to have the, the best and the brightest persons available for any and all positions in this country. Black women have been shut out of those positions for too long. Constance Baker Motley was a trailblazer, but we're talking about decades ago, and the uh, numbers of firsts that are still happening today are far too many. Well, let's talk about why that glass ceiling is doubly thick, maybe even triply thick for, for black women. You've said black women, quote, simultaneously endure entrenched racism and sexism, the compounding effects of which often mean that their experiences of violence and racism are suppressed or overlooked. Now that we're about to see a black woman named, nominated to the Supreme Court, talk about how that entrenched racism and sexism will bear itself out in that instance. Well, I think we can all be optimistic and hopeful that it won't be uh, the, the uh, unfortunate display that we've seen in the Senate with respect to other nominees, but we are bracing ourselves for this to be a significant um, interrogation of the many qualified nominees that might become the final nominee of, of this White House. I am uh, certain that we will see sexism, we will see racism, we will see the intersection of those two in the questioning and the uh, doubts about qualifications. But what has been wonderful is looking at the numerous lists of people that would be overqualified, as some have said, to be on the Supreme Court. And so we're ready for that conversation, we're ready for that battle, and we're ready to point out and call out those instances where Black women are being subject to a different standard or being uh, interrogated in ways that are inappropriate or where assumptions are made about their capacity that are unfounded and unfair and unjust. You know, speaking of that, I was just trying to find the full the full um, quote from Senator John Kennedy, who is a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, somebody who will have a, a vote in whether the nominee gets voted out of committee. And he said he had two concerns. The first one he mentioned was, I want a nominee who knows a law book from a J. Crew catalog. Now, in that statement, there's race isn't mentioned, sex isn't mentioned. But I know in my gut what he's talking about. Talk about how, for, assuming you also find that offensive, why is that offensive? It is deeply offensive and it calls into question his ability to be an objective uh, uh, member of the Senate to properly advise and consent on whether a future nominee is in fact qualified and appropriate. That is laden with assumptions about gender and sex and capacity and uh, frivolity that is just embedded in that statement. It is deeply concerning that he would feel that he has license to make that statement in advance of, uh, of, of vetting a nominee. And I think we need to pay close attention and begin to hold elected officials accountable when they make statements that reveal that they are perhaps incapable themselves of fulfilling the duties of the positions for which they've been elected. Mm -hmm. I, I have said that the, 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 the names of the women who've been mentioned as potential nominees to the Supreme Court are, they're more qualified than a lot of the people who were nominated before them and certainly not who could be nominated after them. But you know, one of the names that's been mentioned as a potential nominee is Sherilyn Eiffel, who currently runs the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund for about another month uh, until, until you uh, succeed her. But talk about the significance of a black woman, no matter who is chosen, sitting on the high court. Well, it will be something that um, I think will be a game changer in terms of how we understand the law and its impact on a segment of society that doesn't often get its day in court and doesn't often have its voice heard. And that is the segment of black women who uh, fuel this country in so many ways, who are on the front lines defending our democracy, uh, putting their bodies on the line, 
to and compromising themselves in many ways to ensure that we uphold our constitutional ideals. We're talking about black women who suffer a significant wage gap in the economy, black women who are becoming incarcerated at an increasingly rapid rate, and black women who are at the margins of society in so many ways. We will now have someone on the court who has some sense of what um, any one of those experiences might be and whether they've personally experienced it, observed it, have relatives who may have those experiences or just having been and being a member of that broader community makes them more attuned to those conditions. And I look forward to seeing that perspective um, uh, borne out in the decisions that are made in uh, the colloquy among the justices on the court and to influence how we interpret laws that will affect black women, all women, and other marginalized groups in our society. And, uh, Janae, will the will the end will the end <laughs> my apologies. Will the LDF play a role in helping to shepherd the eventual nominee through the process? Well, the Legal Defense Fund has been actively involved in judicial nominations for decades. We uh, take this very seriously, as you might imagine, as an organization whose uh, uh, you know trade is to litigate in addition to our many other advocacy tools, we care deeply about the composition of the Supreme Court and deeply about the composition of all of our federal courts and state courts. We have advocated vigorously uh, for more diversity on the court, diversity not only of race and ethnicity, but of professional background. And I have to say, we're quite pleased to see uh, the judiciary diversifying uh, rapidly under President Biden's uh, uh, leadership. However, I will say that in this process, we will be paying close attention to how this nominee is vetted and shepherded through the process. We will not stand by and allow a nominee to be uh, uh, disrespected or disregarded inappropriately. Uh, any nominee should be subject to the scrutiny that any other justice uh, would be subject to. We always uh, or often write a report and, and dig deep into the records of any nominee for the Supreme Court, and we will do just the same for this nominee. However, this nominee must be treated with the same respect and the same fairness that any nominee for the Supreme Court would be. And that is something that we will be paying close attention to. What do you say to those those people who might, as with the, as with the Senator Kennedy comment, where it doesn't like flash bright red, um, doesn't have all the key words that, you know, get people to think, ah, oh, sexism, ah, oh, racism. What, what do you say to folks who will hear, because you and I both know we are going to hear some very coded, thinly veiled, racist things, sexist things, misogynistic things about the nominee. What do you say to folks um, to prepare them for things that might not to them be obvious in the moment? Well, what I want to say first and foremost is that the media has a, a very significant responsibility in this. Uh, the media has an obligation to point out those subtleties, to, to disrobe uh, what are cloaked offenses and uh, assumptions and presumptions about this nominee that might be unfair and that might tilt the process in a way uh, that, that compromises what should be an out, the appropriate outcome. So the media to me is, is first and foremost responsible in translating some of this for the public. And of course, organizations like the Legal Defense Fund um, who are uh, out there talking about um, the way in which the court is critically important as a third arm of our government, that any process that leads to the uh, confirmation of a justice must be free and fair of bias and prejudice. And we will, as I said, be paying close attention to how this process unfolds. And this administration also has an obligation to protect its nominee and to make sure that that nominee is treated fairly. So there are a lot of uh, ways in which we can call it out and ways in which we can make it more difficult for those types of um, assaults or missives to land or have any effect. But the first the first way to do that is to to name it and uh, un unveil it for what it is and not let it be misinterpreted uh, by by anyone, by any member of the public who may not 
fully appreciate some of the subtleties of the process. Mm -hmm. um, let's switch gears here because this month marks 10 years since the death of Trayvon Martin. Talk about the impact of his death and the Black Lives Matter movement sparked by it. Uh, his death and so many others have fueled a movement that I think has been one of the most transformative movements of uh, our generation. It's been a catalyst for uprisings and an outpouring of uh, action and emotion, not just in this country, but across the globe. And it is still what I think is going to fuel what I know will be a, a re-envisioning of public safety in this country and a rededication to uh, core principles of what it means to be an American and to uphold the ideals of this country that have never been uh, completely fulfilled. Mm -hmm. I think seeing that type of injustice up close, seeing the killing of young Black children uh, indiscriminately by law enforcement, by would-be law enforcement vigilantes, uh, those who want to take the law into their own hands. Those are, are instances where racism just can't be denied, where the denigration of Black human humanity and Black dignity is something that you simply cannot turn away from. That is why we saw so many people pouring into the streets in 2020 when we saw the heinous murder and callous murder of George Floyd on the streets of Minneapolis. And that I believe is something that is talking to the hearts and the core of our American public and saying, we will take no more of this. Of course, there have been divisions since there are, it's a complicated issue to solve. And it is, it is, is not something that um, will be solved overnight. If it were, it would have been solved a long time ago. But mm -hmm. I do believe that it is the catalyst that will galvanize young people uh, across generations, across uh, ethnic backgrounds and economic backgrounds to have us rethink the society we want to be in the United States. You know, as you know, the fight for equality and social justice is often described as one step forward, two steps back. Where are we right now in that continuum, do you think? Well, you know, we've made a number of strides. I definitely uh, would say that we are holding, we're trying to hold the line, not to swing, not to have the pendulum swing uh, backwards. But there's, there's, there's no way that we can deny the fact that there is retrenchment, that there is a resurgence of bold white supremacy, uh, unlike that we unlike anything we've seen in recent decades. We've always known that it was there, that it was latent, that it was an invisible force uh, working and wreaking havoc in our society. But now it's been laid bare. We see protests in the street. We see um, uh, attacks not only on individuals, but threats to HBCUs. We're uh, seeing school boards and teachers and administrators being threatened for simply telling the truth of our history. And there's no denying that that is regression, that that is not a, a step forward. That is certainly a step back. But I don't think we have to step all the way back. There is still an opportunity to use that this moment to recognize and to show that the people who are advancing um, this very divisive movement are a minority in this country. And, and it's mm -hmm. easy to forget that because their actions are often, you know, headlines and their actions are, are often, uh, uh, there's often a spotlight on what they do and not enough attention on the ways in which we are unified against those efforts. But there's more that we can do to redouble our opposition to this effort to take us backwards, uh, to make sure that we have the backs of our teachers and the backs of our students who want a culturally responsive, inclusive, culturally and critically rigorous education, uh, which is what the confrontation of our history requires and demands and something that we should embrace. Our children are strong enough for this. They can handle the truth of our history because it will only fortify them in the fight to make the future even better. 
Janae, what does it mean to you to be taking over as president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund? It means the honor of a lifetime. Uh, this is a legacy institution, a black founded legacy institution that has been at the center of holding our democracy accountable to itself. And to be at the helm at this critical time when our democracy is at a crossroads is not only a challenge, it is a privilege and it is an honor. And that is mainly because uh, of the work of past presidents and director councils who have developed and nurtured this organization and have solidified its reputation and the staff that fuels the work that we do and the clients who are at the center of everything that we do at the Legal Defense Fund. It's why we exist. Uh, they are the core of our mission. And it is, as I said, the honor of a lifetime mm -hmm. to be in this position well at this moment. Mm -hmm. What legacy does Sherilyn Eiffel leave and what's the biggest lesson you've learned from her? Well, uh, I think it's hard to summarize Sherilyn's legacy uh, uh, in, a, in a short soundbite, but I would say she's left a legacy of, of transformation and visionary leadership. She has shown not only through her brilliant legal strategy and thinking through uh, the, the critical interventions that were needed on on the front of litigation and research and policy and organizing, but also the ways in which institutions like the Legal Defense Fund need to be fortified in order to ensure that there are checks on our society when they face their darkest moments as we did uh, and as, as we still are facing now. So her legacy will be one of of transformation and fortification. And that is the legacy that I plan to build on with the wonderful staff and team that we have here at the Legal Defense Fund. And there's so many lessons that I've learned in the nearly nine years that she and I have been partnering together here at the Legal Defense Fund. Uh, but the takeaway really is to be, is to be unrelenting and unapologetic about our commitment and dedication to equality and justice, that those are just causes for which we hold no shame and in fact, great pride uh, and, and great passion for advancing on behalf of black communities and on behalf of our democracy as a whole. Janae S. Nelson, currently Associate Director Counsel and but incoming president of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Thank you so much for coming to Capehart and Washington Post Live. Thank you, Jonathan. Good to be with you. And good luck. Thank you. And, and thank you for joining us to check out what interviews we have coming up. Head to WashingtonPostLive.com. Once again, I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Thanks for watching Capehart on Washington Post Live.